Welcome to the Influence Factory podcast. This program is dedicated to support professionals who have a desire to develop their digital business influence so they can navigate through a fast-paced, constantly growing digital world. We invite newcomers as well as our family of business influencers to a place to play, share ideas, questions, tips, and guidance with other thought leaders around the globe. Sit back and enjoy our program with your host, Dean Delisle, as he interviews guests. News and commentary are provided by Jackson Delisle and Monica Hacker. Power Move lessons are provided by the Influencer Marketing Department at Social Jack. And production, editing, and distribution is provided by the Social Jack production team. All right, today's show is brought to you by Planable. Planable.io gives your social media team everything they need to really move their creative process forward. It allows you to preview social media posts as they are live, real time. No more screenshots, mock-ups, spreadsheets, ah spreadsheets your clients can review content from within the platform and do you have anything to say about it monica it's a great platform we've been using it now for a month i love it um it's a game changer in the content world i highly suggest it yeah go to planable p-l-a-n-a-b-l-e.io to start your free trial today This week's influencer guest, David Bloom, writes about the collision of tech and entertainment for Forbes, TV Reb and Tube tube Filter, and is a producer host of the Bloom in Tech podcast. He also consults and is a frequent guest, lector, and speaker. He previously was a USC administrator and a studio executive. He's a graduate of the University of Missouri School of Journalism. David, welcome. Uh, glad to be here and uh, go go Tigers. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I saw, you know, you put down that, um, you know, this is your favorite time of year and it's a favorite time of year for me, but you put down uh, college football and pro basketball. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, this is actually, you've got all the football going, you've got all the basketball going, baseball just wrapped up right. with, a, I guess, a pretty good World Series. That was a great um, World so, Series, yep. Yeah, all things considered, but you've got – hockey going and you know just about every sport is going this time of year and the weather's perfect i grew up in places in the midwest and the northeast where the weather isn't great but this is as good as it gets and so between the cool sports and the wonderful weather it's a great time of year so your pro basketball team of choice oh the lakers yeah there I, i didn't grow up around any team um in the in missouri that was worth spitting at except for the old ABA's St. Louis Spirit, which were more a traveling um, circus than anything else uh, right. for a few years. But, uh, you know, uh, the Lakers, I've been out here for 30 years, and the, the Lakers it look like they're going to be interesting. And so it's fun. And even the Clippers are cool this year. I mean, it's like, oh, who, who knew, right? Right. So. And then, uh, of course, you're a Dodgers fan, right? Uh, more a Cardinals fan. That, oh. I grew up with a real, a real baseball team. Uh real 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 baseball team and Dodgers are fine but you know the Cardinals the uh, Uber Alice there they've been around for a long time winning for a long time they're tough to beat yeah they are and uh, of course we know that because we're the Cubs so we, right. go at, we go at it quite a bit and uh, and I love that new stadium have you been down there for that new stadium uh I mean Bush Stadium yeah it's yeah. great yeah Bush Bush too yeah my my uh actually my my brother who lives on Cape Cod has taken his son my nephew there a few times, which I think is, is proper upbringing. I, uh, I strongly applaud him for that. So uh, it's, a, it's a great stadium. Yeah, absolutely. And then for uh, college football, of course, you said the Tigers, right? Right. But also USC. I, I go to a lot of the USC games. I've been to the five this year and, and USC's had some success. Um, it's been a little more complicated in recent years, but uh, you know, it's a, it's fun to go to the Coliseum, the only stadium in the world that's hosted a World Series and Olympics. Oh, and that's football. right. I forgot about it. And uh, it is a great place. They just did a uh, hundred million dollar makeover, thanks to the fact that the Rams are there for the, at least one more year. And uh, it looks great. It's got seats that actually fit my very broad Midwestern butt. Uh, which is a win and uh, lots of better food. And it's just, it's a great place with an amazing history and, and, you know, all of USC's football uh, glory going back to the twenties and the national championships going back to then. It's, it's a great place to see a game. Yeah. And you and I met at uh, IMCX um, at the influencer conference 
which that was their first conference and a lot of good people coming through that place. And uh, yeah, I was, yeah. I was pleased to meet you and I loved your uh, session there. And, um, and so uh, you and I travel around this circuit a lot with influencers. Right. And, and I love right. the fact that you sort of tie in Hollywood entertainment, digital social media, and all the stuff that's current right. working and not working. Um, right. But but you didn't. We didn't start here, right? We started, you know. Uh, so so, how did you get to the place where you're a top Forbes contributor and you got attached to this influence space? Take us a little bit through that story of yours. Uh, it's a pretty long, twisted, and uh, <laughs> a not recommended uh, career. Path. I mean, calling it a path sort of suggests that there was some, uh, you know, forethought and vision and all that. But I, uh, I started out as a political reporter, did that for 15 years, got a chance to hop over here in Los Angeles to writing about entertainment and technology beginning in the 90s. And wow. that was um, a decision that there were a lot more jobs writing about entertainment in Los Angeles than there are writing about politics and government. And um, I was really good about that, but I was always a tech geek. You know, I remember seeing the Lisa, the Apple forerunner to the Macintosh in, a, the, in Memphis at a computer expo in like 1985 or six or something like that thing. That's pretty cool. And, and being interested in things like VR and digital thespians and all that kind of stuff. And um, the video game space, I had a Pong game when I <laughs> yeah, was right. 12. <laughs> Which and, actually turned uh, into hockey, if you you know, if yeah, you, the layover, if you had the layover screen. Exactly, exactly. So I had all that stuff. You know, so I, I I had a lot of threads of things I was interested. In. I was on the internet very early in '92 or '93, uh, trying to figure out you know what that was when it finally started to become public after 15 or 20 years as just a government, uh, academic, military um, communications device or, or communications network. And, and so I've always had a lot of interest in this stuff. So I got that, I made that jump over, but it was like not just entertainment, but how it connects with technology because tech was just starting to really transform the industry. And uh, so that was the video game space and it was uh, online entertainment in its most uh, nascent form and, oh, and yeah. you know, hobbled by really, 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 really slow connections and you couldn't do video, you do five frames a second or something and it was just pixelated stuff and it was like awful um but all that was really interesting to write about that first internet bubble was interesting to write about less interesting when i got uh, laid off at red herring which was one of the you know great magazines of that first era um but ended up over variety writing about hollywood and ended up then i went to mgm and was handling communications for them I was at USC in the business school handling the communications, but you know, it got us onto things like YouTube. We weren't on YouTube. And so what, did, what attracted right. you to that path? Was it just for you like me and you were just had to see what was next and what was happening? Yeah, or, yeah, right? absolutely. You know, it's like, uh, I guess, if you're a journalist, you always want to know what's the next yeah, new thing. Right. That's literally the description of news is the next new thing. And, and being, a, you know, right at the, 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 the foot of that, you know, is wonderful being able to, to see that as it happens to write about it, to make sense of it, to put it in context, mm -hmm. to communicate that clearly and interestingly to people, I hope interestingly, yeah, that's a, that's a great, cool thing to do. So yeah. I've just sort of followed that and I ended up back in journalism after, um, in, in the last several years, worked at Deadline, which covers mm -hmm. Hollywood in the a very focused inside baseball kind of way. And I was the one explaining to them things like technology uh, left there. And I've been writing for Forbes and a couple of other places since then. And it's been uh, quite a, quite a journey. Yeah, so. that's cool. That's cool. And um, uh, just because you're a sports guy as well, um, are you, um, are you fascinated about our world of stats related to sports? I mean, I'm just like, it's almost like when I'm seeing sports, it's almost like I'm following on my phone and I'm, I'm, I'm almost intrigued by the amount of stuff we're tracking on each player yeah. and team. And yeah. like, oh my gosh, it's like crazy. Oh, it's crazy. I, I remember um, buying the baseball abstract from Bill James in the <laughs> mid 1980s. Right. And that was, that was the gateway drug, right? <laughs> that was the thing 
that no said, no the, no the oh. original no no the original gateway was the bubblegum baseball card uh yeah kind of <laughs> that was eh, maybe sprinkle a little crack in the schoolyard you know but but the baseball card i mean in you, you you didn't understand context. Those were just, it's the difference between uh, numbers, you know, data and, and information. So like yeah, right. having just the data is fine. But what James did was take that data and go to that next level and say, here's why Joe Morgan, you know, he won two MVPs. Arguably he should have won six because right. he was, you know, playing one of the most difficult defensive positions and playing it at a very high level and hitting an extraordinary number of, of not just singles, but all the other stuff and getting a ton of walks. So all of a sudden that guy was way better than traditional baseball understood. Even though they gave him two MVPs, they undersold that guy. I mean, he was extraordinary. And you know, that was like one, oh yeah. And then comparing eras and, and, and you know, why some people's stats were sort of jacked up because they were in a stadium that was strictly good for what they yeah, did. Yeah, that's true, you right. Know, that kind of stuff. So it was a different way to think about the world. And it was the first really data-driven way to think about the world, not just in baseball but uh, or sports, but I think in a lot of stuff. You know, the whole big short um, stuff and, and, right. and that Michael, a lot of the stuff that Michael Lewis has written about yep. starts with Bill James. It really does. And and it's really fascinating. You know, Moneyball was was out of all that, but it starts right. with Bill James. So, man, yeah. So anyway, and I think um, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I notice it more, but I feel like baseball is is maybe has more stats than anybody else. Like every Absolutely. time I turn around, they come out with a different thing. Absolutely. You know, I'm right. Like, Wait, they, they, exactly. So much because they because they they it's so individual performance based. This right. is what the pitcher does, and now it's a pitch by pitch thing you know if you're a football player you know and i was a lineman in football you know and we did all kinds of really important stuff like not get the quarterback killed or right. trying to kill the quarterback if you're the i was a linebacker player. so i was coming for you <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right so but but you don't i mean it's like if you're on the defense at least you got tackles for loss and you got sacks you got that kind of stuff but if you're an offensive lineman that is the most thankless test but really important you know stuff but you don't have good measurements for that and baseball football is trying to figure it out but baseball every single thing you do first of all it's very discreet each action is very defined you know he gets up he throws the ball it's here it's there it's a fastball it's a curveball it's this many miles per hour it's inside it's out, you know etc and then it's like what did the batter do and then he hits it and the house, how, how long does it take the fielder to get to it? You know, they've got all that stuff measured out in such precise detail. So they can go insane on the data. Um, yeah. I don't know that it makes for a better game. Arguably it's a less interesting game in this era than it was 10 or 15 years ago when they did a lot right. of things that the data says are dumb, like steal bases at a low rate of success right. um, or do hit and run or, you know, a lot of things that they used to do, you know, the baseball shifts, you know, the defensive mm -hmm. shifts, it, that's taken a lot of fun out of the game. Yeah, I think so too. And it was interesting because I was listening to, because when Madden was leaving, Joe Girardi was maybe up for the job and things like that. And he talked about, you know, how Theo's a stats guy and everything, a money ball guy. And, and, and then he said that he's always been a stats guy and he said they'd make fun of him because he had a book this thick, you know, the old right. fashioned before right. the iPad right. and oh, before right. stats was collecting stuff. And he would have this giant binder and then Madden was that way too, you know, back. Right, right. And, and you know, I arguably most of the league, you know, the conflict in the recent years has been, are you an old school manager who can still hang on long enough, uh, you know, a Bruce Bochy who's now retired from San yeah. Francisco, but was extraordinarily successful for a, a nice right. run there. Um, or the new guys, you know, the Dave Roberts at, uh, at the Dodgers, you know, and he said, well, they haven't won a world series. So, you know, they got there twice and they got the playoffs again. They won six straight, you know, we uh, uh, Western division titles. I mean, they've done okay, Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, and it's been all number driven uh, in terms of optimizing and finding the right guys and plugging them in. Maybe they should do a better job of getting a bullpen that's more productive and healthy or whatever, but they're really successful and you can't argue with that. So, yeah. Oh, cool um, stuff. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I didn't know we were going that deep, but I just figured you're a sports guy. And I'm like, you're in data with me and then influence stuff. You got to be crossing over somehow. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and actually one of the things that, that came out that I'm going to be writing about this week that I got uh, 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 tweaked in my ear um, 
it was a conversation of a panel. I was at this conference yesterday and I had a conversation that I sat in on, but I wasn't part of, I moderated a panel of influencers, but there was a separate panel of sports um, distribution people talking yeah. about where they're going and all that. And one of the things they talked about just in passing was the new NCAA rules forced by a California state law that just passed that will allow athletes to make money off of their likeness and their name and their picture for the first time. And it was like, oh yeah, wait a minute. Individually, right. Wow. So uh, it used to be uh, that you could, as a team, you know, you get your deal with Nike and the players couldn't receive any money off it, but they got free shoes, right? Or they got a free uniform, whatever. Uh, and um, the, the video game about your right. uh, team, your college football, Ball team could show your number and what looked like you, but was not you. It didn't have your name on it, right? right? And you didn't get paid anything. And then Ed O'Bannon, who led UCLA to a national title in like '97 or something like that, sued over this stuff because, you know, there was a video game with him. You know, the National Player of the Year that year, uh, he got not a nickel out of it, and he sued, and they won. And then this law came along saying, look, <laughs> they deserve it. They should get it. They're not on a plantation. They should get paid. And the next step, though, is what happens when um, you have a star high school quarterback who's already got a following on Twitter or a following on uh, um, Snapchat or, or wherever it may be, Instagram almost certainly, uh, what happens when he takes that big, um, that big following and decides which school he's going to go to based on which one's going to amplify his uh, influencer counts which one's going to be the one that's going to really make him a big name right. online where he's got all his influencer <laughs> deals i mean all the influencer marketing opportunities are really interesting but really complicated right, right. so we got to unpack all that and, and we're going to have thousands of athletes some of whom are going to be really good at social media as well as slinging a football or, or dunking a basketball and what's that going to look like so it's a really fascinating question that we have just begun to play with yeah, and we um, we do a workshop on influencer marketing, both for brands and for the influencers, and and different. And what's interesting is we've collected sample contracts to help people out, and and so we'll talk about it. And just in the last year, there's been over seven hundred platforms, influencer platforms released. Seven hundred. Oh, and 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 I think I've a, been pitched by six hundred and ninety five of them actually <laughs> right? for stories. <laughs> right. Maybe so, six hundred and ninety seven. So it's yeah, somewhere pick in there, up, well we so. do a we do a top forty sheet. So imagine living through that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow so, so like anyway to you and your family so. yeah right so so but these contracts it's so crazy and then uh you you mentioned something earlier when you were doing this panel of how the whole landscape of social media around influencer marketing for any of us is starting to change because they're yeah. suppressing and and i like the fact that they're forcing more authenticity i do like that part but tell me mm -hmm. what you like, maybe what you don't like, and some things you know that are coming up uh, that you're seeing. Well, I uh, I'm fascinated in the the fracturing of the of the, the the platforms out there. So and they're and they're striated by by demographics by age, right? So uh, Facebook is the old, right? That's no doubt about it. It's the old people, and Twitter is probably a little younger, maybe, and they certainly got these subgenres of. Uh, you know, black Twitter and uh, uh, media Twitter and some of those things that are, are their own little universes. And that's, but that's, right. that's a little bit older. But then you get to um, uh, Instagram and that's probably mostly people in their 20s and 30s is where it, that's really the sort of sweet spot. And Snapchat's a little bit younger than that. It's more like high school into college. And then TikTok, TikTok the new TikTok, one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, it's your 12 year old kid sister or niece or whatever. And, 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 Personally, I'm, I'm not a big fan of TikTok because of the uh, uncomfortable relationship that its, its parent company has with the Chinese government and what the Chinese government's doing in terms of surveillance and, and all that. I'm not really excited about having uh, America's youth surveilled effectively by right. I'm, I'm uh, really the Chinese that. government. And, and I don't think we've really unpacked all that. And they like to say, oh, well, it's not that. But, you know, they, they certainly have to bow to pretty 
severe censorship censorship restrictions by the Chinese government right. on things like their treatment of Muslim minorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it gets to be really complicated, and um, I think it's really problematic, and we'll see how it plays out. There's no denying that TikTok is huge and having a vast influence on things like the music business. You know, Old Town Road, TikTok is taking credit for breaking Old Town Road into right. the, you know, the best – uh, selling uh, song maybe ever um, in terms right. of its listening. It was top, top, it's the number one song for 16 or 17, 17 straight weeks. Well, so. and what's, yeah, and what's crazy about this, and, and you're seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing this too, is we have the mega, the macro, the micro, and the nano influencers. So yeah. each of these are starting to parse out as those groups that you mentioned. And right. then there's the platforms and how they cater, help, or hurt each one of those yep. segments. Right. And right. I think that's and where, where do you where do you choose to be? Right. I mean, it's right. like you pick your platform, but maybe you've got to be on the other ones too. I mean, but how do you do stuff? How do you create? I mean, you guys are creating content for the live audience, and you're turning around and repackaging it and putting it out on as a podcast on top of that, which is smart but exhausting. You have to have your and blogging team. and blogging and, and blogging. Doing press. We do press on this. So. Right. I mean, you've got, you've got your vast team of supporters here, you know, Jackson and Monica and all the rest. And, and I can't even imagine how large your media machine is, but you're everywhere. Cause you have to be right. And I'm doing it on a smaller scale, but I'm lots of places and repackaging and putting it out. Cause I got to do it at, at my level too, because that's what it is now. We're all one person media machines or, you know, we've got you as the, the, the flagship of the, 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 the fleet that you have behind you to make this all happen. That's just where we are now. And every major influencer has a team. Um, they just, can't not they just can't do it otherwise well what's interesting so. about all this is you didn't mention youtube in the list right i and mean it's almost of... like it's background noise right but it's there. right I, mean, it's it's... Not, I don't mean it it's just it's no like, i know okay, but i start there and we I... go from there I was at a I was at an influencer event uh, that happened to be in San Diego, which was at a headquarters of Halanis, which is another uh, influencer platform that we deal with, and they you know they're in Beverly Hills too to, to host the parties, but then headquarters is in San Diego. But I'm meeting people that I did better parties in Beverly Hills, by the way. I just want to say what's that better par better parties in Beverly Hills. without a doubt. With that's why you I go to the one. <laughs> yeah, you go to the ones in San Diego, you just want to kick back and play over the line and have a couple of brews, man, and just uh, but I, fish tacos. But I'm meeting these young influencers like Taylor Kniff. I had no idea who that was. And then Waka right. Flocka Flame and my people back here. Right. Like, oh, my right. God, you're drinking a beer with Waka Flocka. And I said, ah, yeah, I don't know. I'm just talking to him like a human. I don't know who he is. Right, right. And then, you know, some have hoodies and some are looking cool. And so I'm having conversations. But... What's right, interesting right. is is the one kid's making I think two hundred grand a month on YouTube without even right. going to Instagram yet. I'm just like, right, right, doing what? And then you look, and it's it's just goofy stuff. <laughs> For right. me, and a lot of them, a lot of them are doing doing goofy stuff, but they're doing what's the you know they'll do like what's the thing that's hot? This oh, it's edible food art, you know. So they'll right. do pancakes, <laughs> pancakes that look like I don't know uh, Darth Vader or whatever. But they'll all do that. And, <laughs> They'll all get an audience. I mean, this whole manufactured fight that happened, uh, boxing match, that it was the second one, second round between KSI and uh, uh, who was the other guy, um, um, uh, Logan Paul. Right. I mean, that is pure made up. I mean, it, it makes the world wrestling uh, uh, WWE look like um, the NFL in terms of, you know, not premeditated spectacle uh designed purely to look like something that matters and is athletic but is not and 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 the funny part was that that uh, at least the first one i think it happened this one too there was as much money being made in terms of views and stuff like that by people talking about this thing as the guys themselves you know beating each other in the head and right. it was sort of funny all the stuff around it was getting you know 10 million views it's like what the heck so it's a pretty crazy stuff but but at least there's an ad share there that is about there, there's some money there i think the more complicated thing is how you take something like um instagram which doesn't really do revenue share right. and you make money off of that 
But how do you make the money? Well, it's going to be off your brand deals. And now that's going to get complicated because they, they're not showing likes publicly anymore. You get the back end, but now you got to go through Instagram to get those if you're a company. So, right. you know, that's all getting really complicated. In terms, and you have to register as a business. You have to register as a business, you know. And, right. and if you're an individual right. and then, you know, oh, now I'm a business, you know. So right, right. It's all business, man. So yeah. and it's, it's, a, it's and a really interesting time. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting time. And then, um, you know, you mentioned uh, streaming earlier. And because again, we're, we're in sports, and you just actually covered an article that I was reading about, because I was I was surprised that WWE was making their appearance. I'm watching Fox, and they go and featuring Friday Night Fight. And I'm like, that's coming back? Right. What's going on? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then it's like, uh, oh, but you know, you can stream it here. And it's also on the mainstream media. So so yeah, I mean, you... to its credit, WWE has been really smart about this stuff. I mean, yeah. they have maximized their resources with streaming for several years now. They've been on the same uh, company, BAM, or BAM Tech, that Disney is now using, that Disney bought it, spent a billion dollars to buy into, and is using for Disney Plus. So WWE has been- Oh, that's the same, plat the same backup? Yeah, same platform. Oh, okay, so okay. so BAM, BAM Tech started with baseball which was on this stuff pretty early on because there's lots of people who, you know, they're like me, I like the Cardinals, but I live in Los Angeles. I don't see a lot of Cardinals games right. unless I want to pay to stream those games. And that's what Bam Tech started doing. And they got so good at it. They started doing, they white labeled it and started doing things with WWE and some other guys. And then Disney said, Oh, we don't want to build this thing from scratch. We need somebody who knows what they're doing. So they bought into uh, Bam Tech, uh, and now they're using him for Disney Plus, which wow. had a, a bumpy start yesterday. Yeah, but I saw that. It'll be just, it'll be just fine. Yeah, it'll well. be fine. It's like shocking that there's a shakeout, right? And it's going to happen. It's tech. So, yeah, um, right. And do you yeah, think? Uh, do you think that uh, WWE learned anything from like uh, UFC? Because UFC sort of went through sort of its pay per view. It almost went under, came back, went to streaming. So we saw a lot of. Right a lot of things right. happen in there too, right? Yeah, I mean, UFC, uh, and I'm not a particular fighting fan. Uh, it's not really a thing that works, does much for me, but uh, UFC had a good product, but clearly got out over their skis some. And yeah. if you know the 40 or 50 year history of WWE and its mm -hmm. predecessor, WWF, uh, you know, back in the 80s, they had a big competitor that was funded by Ted Turner and Turner Sports, and they had the deal with that and right. then they eventually merge again like the nba and the aba right yep. um or the nfl and the all-american football league right. back in the day and, and the afl uh, over the years but but they they had their challenges they had their ebbs and flows of popularity i think some of that's just sort of natural as they get new new stars and new fans kind of discover the new stars but they definitely had to go through some growing pains in wwe has had that too, but they've been pretty smart about providing um, platforms for new sets of fans to come to them and get into it. And I think that's really key. I mean, given the work that you do working with influencers, you know that the, the point is to find your fans and super serve them, give them everything you can to make them happy, right? Yep. And that means not just the Friday night fights, but it's the social media around that all week long. And it's the behind the scenes videos and it's the, uh, the lifestyle videos and it's selling the merchandise and it's having the experience spread out. I mean, the NFL is getting better and better about, you know, making the NFL, not just about what the season is, but, yeah. and not the postseason, but it's the pro bowl and it's the draft combine and it's the draft and it's, you know, all that stuff gets smeared. They, they are, they're engaged with their audience in a heavy duty way as much as 10 months a year for those fans. That's a big deal. I mean, who imagined 20 years ago that uh, ESPN televising a bunch of guys in shorts doing 40 yard dashes would be <laughs> right. compelling TV for a significant audience or even I the mean, guys that don't make it. Uh, the guys that don't make it, you know, stories about these guys. And then, you know, you've got all these sort of spinoff things like Last Chance You and, and yeah. things like that about and, and the the, the um, HBO shows about each team, you know, the yes. hard knock stuff and on, right. and on and on. So all that stuff's about football and it is a, you know, a giant 
TikTok of, of minutes of time uh, viewing. I mean, I saw some some stat that broke out by minutes viewed. And football is gigantically popular in this country. College football, pro football, all these other things. People watch it all the freaking time, and it's crazy. Yeah, I was listening to an interview this morning with uh, David Meerman Scott. You know, he does a lot of uh, marketing growth stuff. Uh, we all pretty much know of him. But he talked about uh, raving fans, and he said – you know, companies and businesses don't understand, but the reason sports teams or a sport, you know, collects fandom, if you will, is because there's like-minded people and the community is, is so engaged together with it, it becomes automatic. And, and he said, that's the main thing that's missing for organizations is they just don't understand that it's about creating raving fans on the inside with the team and that collaboration right. and, and feeling good about each other. And then that magnifies into the right. audience, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, you, no one gets into a fight about whether they, they like to go to Kroger's versus Albertsons versus right. Vons. No one does that. Right. But tell me what the difference is between the angels and the Dodgers versus, you know, Albertsons versus Vons. There's, there's really not one. Right. Right. But, right. but, People will definitely get into a fight over Dodgers versus Angels or Cardinals versus Cubs. <laughs> they'll fight for their uh, team, right? They'll fight for their team. It's like, okay, what did I miss here? But, you know, that's what it is. So um, th 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 there's lessons there for brands, I think, to try to figure out about how you engage those people and how you connect them. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, I was curious to get your insights just reading through some of your uh, more, more recent Forbes articles. But, you know, I grew up, you know, originally you mentioned the eighties, so I can mention my, you know, date myself here too, is, is like, you know, I remember before there were remotes and you had to like, you know, get up and change the channel for my dad. Yeah. Your stuff. remote was your, your, your remote was your little brother. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. me for my dad. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Go change the channel. Yeah. yeah and don't flick it yeah. too hard because you'll mess it up. You'll screw up the reception man come on so yeah, yeah that's, that's so but uh so so we grew up in a live environment and then they teased us out over time with you know pay-per-view if you want to see this event you can't be there pay 70 dollars to see this boxing match or to see this you know i think it happened right. for boxing right around with tyson i think pay-per-view was yeah was, was really getting hot then Don I, King I think, and those guys. yeah i think it was it was probably late 80s early 90s yeah somewhere the technology grew up enough that they could really deliver that consistently and there was enough of an installed base and the cable operators to be able to get that in there Delivered, that was the other right. thing Cable didn't really take off till the 80s. So, right, right. Uh, MTV blew that up, huh? <laughs> yeah, it really did. You know, I mean, it was one of those things. It's like, uh, it, you know, I remember people saying, oh, no one's going to pay for free. No one's going to pay for free TV, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and because you can get everything you need on ABC, NBC, and CBS, and it comes over the air, and that's all you need, right? And it turned out you know, HBO, which was founded in 74, was the first one. And, of course, they had, like, movies that you, you – know, it didn't used to be you could see movies. Right. After you they have to buy a VHS theaters. or something, you know. Oh, so. they didn't even have that, man, until 83 or yeah. 84, right. I think. You know, but before that, it was – it was that was it you know the movie ran in the theater that was it maybe you could see it in a, 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 a revival theater in new york or los angeles um or some art house would have something but otherwise that was it you're done running one and done it was sat in it sat in the warehouse and uh um so it's it it didn't really take off till the 80s and and you're right the pay-per-view first started coming up and all of a sudden you had a way to monetize in a different way for a specific audience that wasn't a big, it didn't have to be a big audience. It had to be a, a audience willing to pay a, a good chunk of money for the privilege. And now that's what TV is, is everything's pay-per-view. Yeah, absolutely. And essentially, right. I don't even know how many subscriptions we have to how many things. And then you have to decide where did I store that movie I bought? You know, it's, it's, that's a whole nother right, complication. Right. Um, but, but yeah, what I'm, exactly. what I'm thinking about is we're in such a, we're in such a, consumer mindset where uh, it's all about convenience and you know what's best for me so if I want to binge watch I can do it at my own pace I just wait for the whole series to come out I burn a weekend and I'm binge watching or if it's right. sports I usually like to get it live but if I need to I could you know have it streamed while I'm at the gym or I could I could you know so so we're in this still in this flux I think where the value 
is the value of live really still the value of live or do you see it starting to shift where there's just going to be more and more on demand stuff i mean there's so well, many things happening there so right i i think that i mean and and rupert murdoch and fox have made this bet in a very large way they sold off basically all their, their time shifted content to disney and they took 71 billion dollars for the privilege and right. you know good on them for that i guess so i hate to root for rupert um but <laughs> what they kept what's interesting is they didn't sell everything right he kept um fox he kept fox news he kept fox business he got rid of his sports channel his sports regional sports networks but i think and then disney had to, to get rid of him because of divestment divestiture requirements right. but he kept fox and fox's sports uh investments he kept the news operations the 24-hour news operations and business news operations and that's really his plays live sports live news and reality competitions which are basically sports wearing fancy costumes right. you know less functional people possibly uh, but you know the the masked singer is another kind of sport um competition it's just there's no yard markers um but it's all about live I and mean, live 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 and linear so and and twitch is booming because it's about live now yeah, that's true that doesn't mean it's as big as youtube i mean what i hear from the twitch people that i talk with is that um they build an audience on twitch but they monetize more on youtube they take right. it to package it they just do the greatest hits or the highlights and they fill that up there and people can find it when they find it so there's a market for both you know there's people like linear people don't necessarily want to do all the programming themselves sometimes they want it to come to them and I don't think that's going to change even with new generations coming up. I think they're still going to like getting a set of stuff that's presented to them. It's like, oh, okay. That's a of whatever hanging in for live experience is, is really still by it, it's still it still matters yeah, it's interesting like uh, i don't know if you uh caught wind of it but here in chicago you know they were on wgn forever so that's why there were so many cubs mm -hmm. fans as they could watch it anywhere in the country and it was on wgn right. and and they, right. they grew a lot of fans that way and so uh which was smart but now all of a sudden it's gone so now they have their own private network if right. you want to watch the cubs you have to stream it from this private from mark from marquee right yeah. so and, and and what's interesting about that is the the deal that they did was with sinclair broadcast group which right, bought right. bought those 21 regional sports networks that were part of fox that got sold oh, to disney okay. but disney had to get rid of so they spent 10 billion dollars with some help from some others 10 billion dollars to buy those 21 networks and then they spent whatever they're going to spend in partnership with the Cubs to launch one for the Cubs called Marquee this next season. And they went in with Amazon and the New York Yankees to buy back what the Yankees didn't still own of the, the Yes Network, which is basically the Yankees and some other sports in New York. So they made a huge bet on these regional sports networks. Uh, again, betting that not, and, and this is literally betting because they anticipate, I've talked to their CEO, Chris Ripley, they expect that sports gambling will be a big opportunity for them as broadcaster slash cable operators oh. because people will want to watch the game and bet on the game in the game. Real and time. Real time. And the, the U.S. Supreme Court threw out some restrictions on each state being able to legalize gambling and you've seen it already take off in about yeah. 10 states uh new jersey i mean there was a new york times piece i think just in the last couple of days about all the hardcore new york sports fans who go across the river to eastern new jersey to bet on games during the games and that is a gigantic business i mean a year ago uh three months into new jersey's legalizing they already had a, a handle of several hundred million dollars and that's the amount of money bet. So that's crazy. So um, that will happen. It won't be every state. You know, you can imagine there's going to be some states that don't like drinking and they don't like gambling yeah. and they're not going to legalize it, but there's going to be a bunch more. They're going to be okay. And the guys who have the sports rights are going to wrap sports information around that and, and that will allow in-game betting. 
the prop bets. Uh, well, and, and uh, we have like right over the border in Indiana from Chicago here, there's a, a sports book and the ads are, you know, you can get rid of your bookie now because now it's legal. Yeah. <laughs> it's not legal. Come to Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> right. Another reason to go to Indiana, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, who can resist, right? But, but it's absolutely going to be a big deal for a set of folks and right. uh, it's got big impacts on Vegas, but the opportunity more generally is, to figure out how you wrap that information around live broadcast again live is going to matter and somebody like rupert with his big english uh, investment you know live sports betting in Eng in in europe is huge yeah. you know it's mostly on soccer but you know one of the other channels that uh, sinclair owns is the tennis channel and one of the things ripley said is in tennis is the second most bet on, on sport in europe because of the way it's structured you know it's got really? all these like you know it's like game set match uh, every game you know like this so-and-so is going to have an ace this this game you know or so-and-so is going to win this this uh set you know they you can bet during the game it's like 70 percent of the betting on those matches is during the match so he thinks that tennis and they've got a bunch of tennis rights is going to be an opportunity for them and they're busily building their stuff around that for tennis which seems crazy but somebody watches tennis and the ones that do may want to also bet and they'll want to do it for the Chicago Cubs when they get a chance, whether it's in Gary, Indiana, or it's in, you know, uh, um, Evanston, Illinois, they're going to want to do that. So right. they want to take advantage of that. So I think it's really smart and we'll see how it plays out, but it's, it's changing that whole dynamic is with the gambling and the gambling yeah, that's information. An, that's interesting. Um, you know, and it's, what, what do we always say? Follow the money, right? <laughs> so yeah. Follow yeah. The money. Absolutely. So, so that's going to be a lot of money. That's going to be billions of dollars floating around and it yeah, won't be going to the bookies. So Yeah. Right. Right. And uh, you know, there's uh, and then they'll figure out how to tax it. So well, they already have. So. Well, that's, that's, that's why the States are legalizing and trust me, it's right. uh, they think they can, they can pull uh, a chunk of that change, regulate it instead of it being in the underground economy and they can make some money off of that. So that's what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so you also had, um, I read an article from you about um, Amazon sort of, sort of creeping up and possibly blowing away Instagram uh, from an influencer standpoint. Well, I think that what they've got is, um, and I think anybody that's getting in bed with Amazon is probably doing it carefully, but they do some things that influencers can use um, in terms of merchandise and affiliate marketing and revenue and they have twitch and they have a bunch of media <laughs> assets and they have you know on and on and on so you can see you know they've, they've got like a service that does um you know if you're an influencer and you want to create uh, merchandise that um, is branded with your your stuff whatever your product is and sell your book, you know, your best selling book that, you know, everybody's 20 years old is doing a biography now, an autobiography um, and killing it. Um, they can do all that for you and they can do it very efficiently and generate a lot of money and help you know who your audience is and, and uh, help you sell against that. And that is pretty interesting. And right. I mean, you get to pick your fang your fang friend, uh, whether it's Amazon or Facebook, and uh, take your pick, you know, who you, um, they're hard to miss, but, but because they have the e-commerce component, there's a set of, of, of data, there's a, uh, the, the, the back end through AWS, there's the merch functions. I mean, all that stuff is really interesting and compelling. And again, if you're in Twitch, and you're overlaying your e-commerce and you're overlaying a bunch of, you know, other kinds of bits of stuff that all of which Amazon can provide, it can be pretty compelling for a yeah. whole set of influencers. So, yeah, that's, uh, um, I find it interesting. Yeah, I, I know. It's just, um, and, it, and it's curious to see, I mean, they definitely have enough money to sort of take over whatever market they want at this point, you know, so we'll see. It seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're getting, they're, they're opening their own grocery stores. They already had Whole Foods. They bought yep. for 13 or 14 billion, but they're going to open an Amazon store. They've got other brick and mortar stores. Uh, I see that Nike um, is getting out of Amazon because Amazon is killing their margins and they, and, and they tend to, you know, copy and do their own house brand. So they're like, screw it. We're going to go do our own thing. 
um, Amazon's Amazon's kind of everywhere. So. Well, I know, and I have uh, my uh, new book uh, that was published on Amazon, but it's interesting because as an as an Amazon author, there's like three places I have to log on depending on what I want to do. And it's very confusing. So, and you can't ever get customer right, support. Right. And I'm like, decide, please just give, you know, authors one place to work. Right. <laughs> like, right. you know, here for my money, here for my one books. And I don't even know why I'm here. You know, it's like. <laughs> right, right. I got it. I got it. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, uh, when you automate everything, you there's going to be questions that the automation can't deal with. So it's yeah. pretty frustrating for it's humans. Crazy. It's like dealing with Uber, right? If you have an issue, they have things that can answer a lot of questions. They can't take care of everything. No, uh, but their whole point is we're going to automate as much of this, you know, the we, we hire drivers by software. We hire, we rate drivers by software. We dispatch drivers by software we pay them by software we don't have humans involved so we can get really really big with very very few people well that's great until you actually have a people question that needs to be answered and that's that's the challenge we're going to be facing in, in all of this stuff so so as a you know as a as a major forbes contributor and obviously life lifelong journalist you've interviewed a ton of people so any uh, predictions you want to throw yeah. out there? Any predictions you want to throw out there for 2020 in terms of where you see our digital world heading, whether it's influencer related or not? Well, I mean, I think that the big conversation is going to be around the streaming services and how they transform um, how we consume entertainment, but also how they transform how we produce entertainment, which is the big question in Hollywood and what that means for um old business model we've sitting here talking about the rise of the cable industry and pay-per-view and all that stuff well you know the cable bundle has been eroding quickly oh, and yeah. it may be headed to collapse um in in the near term what will what that means is the lesser channels that populate sort of the bottom of the cable bundle i think are in real trouble you know the ESPN seven <laughs> or the, the you know, VHS. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. VHS 23 I mean, or VH1 23. Uh, you know, you, you, you did those things in the past to, to have a bigger presence on the cable bundle, right? To, yeah. Again, sort of super serve people that were watching your brand who wanted to see, MTV, but didn't necessarily want to see that music video. They want to see something else that's MTV related. Well, that works until people can go online and pick whatever they want to watch. And that's where we are now. So I'm going to have access to Apple Plus, and I'm going to have access to HBO Max in April, and I'm going to have access to Peacock from Comcast in April, and I've got Disney Plus as of yesterday. Uh, Marquee uh, Network. If you're a Cubs a fan, <laughs> lesser, about three hundred. If you're a Cubs fan, and Marquee, uh, yeah, you know the, the 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 sports the sports channels will be coming up, but there's three hundred other SVOD, that's subscription video on demand channels out there. Wow, and that's going to be all of your programming. Why would you use a cable provider? Uh, but really, the cable providers are going to become services providers for data. So yeah. we see Comcast now already has more internet customers than um, cable TV customers, pay TV yeah. customers by several million. And the same thing with Spectrum. And that's only going to continue. So they're going to provide the pipe. We've got 5G coming. So that'll be uh, a competitor to what cable does um, in terms of getting um, high quality content to you anywhere you are on your phone, on your, uh, your laptop, in your home, wherever you are, uh, and things we can't quite imagine. So that'll be pretty interesting. But, but I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what this means for Hollywood and the stuff that gets made and where you're working. And uh, all of a sudden, a bunch of jobs that used to be pretty secure, we've already seen several thousand people get dislocated by the mergers. Uh, the mergers happened because of all this stuff. It's going to really start playing out, and that's going to have big impacts in Hollywood that are not going to be fun. Um, we will eventually have what uh, a colleague of mine, Alan Wolk, likes to call the great rebundling, which means that 
we've got all these options and now they're going to start bundling and huddling together for warmth <laughs> in this new era because you can't go it alone right so we've already seen disney plus is not just going out as disney plus it's also right. going out as Dis disney plus plus espn plus plus hulu right. right so that way you get sort of a disney bundle and if you just want to be owned by the mouse house um, <laughs> that's a lot of content and yeah. that's sports You've got TV accessible, including back episodes, and you've got everything that Disney's got on Disney Plus, which is a lot. So that's going to look attractive to people. Um, I don't know what the economics are that they're selling it for like 12 or 13 bucks. It's a pretty tough bundle right. to resist, I think, for a lot of folks. But but what does it mean for everybody else who's out there? Peacock's going to have a lot of content. Maybe they offer it for free. Well, okay, great. So what does that mean? Because Comcast owns it. And Comcast may give it away to everybody that's a Comcast broadband provider or right. subscriber. Okay. Well, that's a little bit like what Apple's doing with Apple Plus, right? You buy right. an Apple iPad or uh, iPhone or Mac, you get Apple Plus for free. And people say, well, that's still probably too, too expensive for some people. <laughs> Right. It's like, you should pay me to watch this, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's going to get better and it'll be fine and Apple will figure it out. And da, da, da. Uh, but, but that's where we're going. We're going to see um, Hollywood get hammered in ways it can't expect as the new guys build out what they're doing and change the way we watch stuff and the economics will be different and it's not really clear what it's all going to look like by the time it gets done. But next year is going to be a change a year full of transformation and change and dislocation. That's that's my prediction. Yeah, there you go. And and yeah, I think you're spot on with uh, with that as well. Well, I enjoyed uh, having you on, and I enjoy your content. I enjoy reading your uh, Forbes article. So ever since I met you, I've been uh, a follower of your <laughs> writing and your work and uh, all of that out there. And uh, God bless you, Jen. Yeah, and uh, and so we'll publish uh, some uh, people to your LinkedIn because you're you're an active, uh, you know, you post actively on there when you do publish those articles. Your Twitter is David Bloom, uh, pretty easy, uh, and then um, your uh, website is davidlbloom.com. Correct? Do I have that right? I think I have that right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, to, I mean, I post my stuff on Twitter and LinkedIn all the time. Because you know, things we get to do is yeah, for sure. To do that. Yeah, He's, and, yeah, and we'll publish uh, we'll publish this to our audience so they can uh, so they can definitely uh, connect back and uh, and and you know follow follow your work and follow your writing and, and follow you as well. And again, I want to thank you for being such a thought leader, contributor, and one of our influencers out there. And remember to our audience, um, if you uh, learn something, you know, whatever you learn today, and as you apply it to your own business, uh, please think about uh, the people um, in, uh, you know, in your world that you're an influencer for and help uh, help teach those people, you know, something that uh, uh, David, that you learned from David, or maybe his insights to the future. Um, please share that. You know, some of you are in, in corporations, uh, maybe share it even with your family, but but you learn something new today. And whatever you learn today, you want to take that and, and share that with somebody that you're an influencer to. So that's how you continue your thought leadership and continue your influence. So uh, David, we have you back, I think. So we lost you there for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know where I went, but it was. I think Comcast stole part of our bandwidth or something. But. Yeah, that's probably what, you know. They were, they, they <laughs> the mouse, the, the mouse in the house. Or yeah. yeah, right. It was, uh, they were just joking back. It's Spectrum out here, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to guess they, they didn't like me talking about their competitor that much. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> They're always listening, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's one of the things to be concerned about going forward. So I was talking right. about TikTok and the Chinese government. So, I mean, that's not going to stop. So uh, we better figure out how we're going to make our way through that, too. So Right, exactly. Anyway. All right, my man. Well, listen, uh, it was great having you on. It was great seeing you again, even though I'd rather see you in yeah. person. So I'm sure our paths will cross. I did recommend you for a couple of conferences coming out. So uh, 
Okay, I, I appreciate out to that. You. Uh, when I okay. think coming close to you, I don't know it's in LA, but it's it's somewhere out that way. So, and I'm uh, I've got some more trips. I know to San Diego and LA. So when I'm heading out, I'll look you up and see if uh, see if you're in yeah, town. Give me a holler. Can, yeah, make some things happen. That'd All right, my man. Well, thank you so much. And then we'll let you know when this airs and then we'll do a write up on it and we'll tag you and all that good stuff. And then uh, again, thanks Fantastic. for your con thanks for your contribution, your knowledge and your leadership in this space. And uh, you're definitely one of our influencers and we'll look forward to more <laughs> from you. Okay. Thanks so much, Dean. Take care. Right. Thank you for listening to the Influence Factory podcast. We welcome feedback and suggestions. You can provide these by visiting our website at www.myinfluencefactory.com. And if you are interested in Social Jack's 90 Days to Influence program, you can simply go to 90daystobusinessinfluence.com and simply ask for the next steps. While our program airs regularly on Zoom webcasts and Facebook Live on Wednesdays at noon central, we invite you to download episodes on your favorite channel, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and who knows where else in the future. We will also provide occasional on-location live streams with special guests that we will announce in our community Facebook group, Business Influencer Alliance, as well as on all Social Jack channels. Our mission is to help you build your digital business influence with this podcast, as well as inspire, educate, and entertain those who are hungry to collaborate in a cool place with cool business professionals just like you.